Welcome to the Ann Toy Show. Today we have with us Matthew Carter, model, actor, filmmaker, and author, HIV and AIDS advocate, and founder and CEO of A Real Desire. Hey, Antoy, how are you doing? Doing great today. So excited to have you on the show and talk about you and your journey and your work and everything that you've been up to. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. All right, so let's get to it. Let's talk about who you are and where you're from. Yeah, I was born and raised in a little country town called Daytona Beach, Florida. I lived there for about, about 23 years. I've always wanted to visit and hang out there. Yeah, I have a lot of a lot of stories I could tell you about Florida. I learned a lot living in Florida. Uh, grew up, my mom raised five kids by herself. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was six years old. One of the main things Daytona Beach is known for is the racing. Other than that, if you love the beach, if you love Miami, which a lot of people seem to love Miami lately, they're heading there uh, since uh, this pandemic. It's a nice place to go to if you like the heat. So let's move a little bit into talking about your modeling and acting. I actually started um, modeling when I lived in Florida. Uh, I had an experience walking through the mall and someone scouted me from an agency uh, by throwing a penny at me. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't throw like a quarter? Like <laughs> they could have threw some dollars and some fifties, but yeah, it was like, I guess the, the only thing that they can throw that was gonna get my attention. And it was it was kind of a, a weird experience because growing up in, in high school, middle school, elementary school, I was always called ugly. I never thought that someone would see me as a model. I, I mean, it was just something that I never would expect would happen for me. And it was really amazing. I got a chance to walk in a lot of fashion shows living in Florida, which is, again, one of the reasons I left, left Florida to go to Atlanta because I wanted to um, go more into modeling. I felt that Atlanta would be the place that I would actually have opportunity to actually grow more into the modeling industry. Acting was something I wanted to do, but I was told I couldn't do. So I kind of put it on the back burner because of the people in the church that told me that I was not supposed to be an actor. I was destined to be a pastor. But when I got to Atlanta, I actually um, came across some people that kind of allowed me to shift out of that mode. And I began to do a lot of stage plays and then I kind of shifted into a background and then independent films with a lot of people. So it's been, it's been a very, very um, amazing journey. Um, just coming into contact with a lot of people with the acting, the, the print work I work, I, I model for a couple of magazines. And it's always interesting to me how people can tell you <laughs> what you can and can't do. That was the crazy part. I, I, and I want to say, especially as a child, when you hear things like that, it can, it can definitely um, cancel your dreams because you're, you're expecting people to pour into you at a young age. And when they don't and you don't have the confidence yourself, it can definitely cause you to stop. How were you able to, even with all those voices, still like pursue it? I was always told I was weird as a child uh, because I would pray a lot. I was I was a praying I was a praying kid because my mom um, I watched her and I saw how things happened on a miraculous level and it made me you know gravitate towards that. So even though they were telling me that I wasn't supposed to be doing something, I still found myself praying. And I would hear voices telling me to keep going forward. And I will always have dreams as well. And because of those dreams, I, it was hard for me to just completely stop. So I always had in the back of my mind that I still wanted to kind of do it. And then when I actually moved to Atlanta, the church that I actually uh, connected with, they kind of helped me to understand that whoever was telling me that was being misguided and that I should have not um, stopped, but there's still opportunity for me to keep moving forward. And then it also helped me to understand that what I was hearing was not the devil, like I was being told, but it was definitely something that I should continue to listen to, and it was gonna help me to actually evolve to be uh, the person that I was destined to be. And 
they kind of poured into me in a positive way, kind of canceling out the negative things that people were saying. And also too, it, the church that I was going to in Florida, they didn't do um, any kind of plays or any like things that churches normally do. The churches in Atlanta did. So every Easter or uh, Christmas time, you know, they had me to participate because they knew how passionate I was about uh, pursuing that uh, dream as an actor. Let's talk a little bit about your work with HIV and AIDS as an advocate. When I got my diagnosis, um, after going through my transition of crying, trying to figure out why me, why me, and uh, hearing God tell me, why not you? Again, reflecting on everything that I've overcome and realizing that I was being used to kind of pour into people and restore a lot of people who had that diagnosis as well. And started searching different companies who actually uh, allow people to be advocates um, to talk about the diagnosis with HIV. Also started reflecting on growing up and hearing about other people who were diagnosed. And the first thing people would say is, oh, they're sick. And it was just a negative thing. And I wanted to show people that just because someone was diagnosed with something, it, it didn't have to always reflect something negative. But I just took it upon myself and hearing the voices that I was hearing to, to move forward and to spread light and be a light for somebody and just connect with companies and told them, hey, if you're looking for someone to, to speak about this, I have been understanding a lot of people are afraid to even talk about it, say anything about them having it. I would love to share my story and be a face to kind of educate people, to give them understanding from what I'm learning so that they don't feel alone. And a company called Gilead was just very touched by a lot that I was doing and, and self, you know, advocating. And they decided to go ahead and bring me in and make me part of the team. In the 90s, I was living in New York and when HIV and first came out, it was, it was scary. It was a scary time for everyone. And I think people thought at that time, you know, if they contracted HIV, it was like literally a death sentence. What are some things you can kind of tell us right now as far as educating us about HIV and AIDS? Well, a lot of people actually still do feel like it's a death sentence, especially the people who get diagnosed um, it's how they found out. The, the medicine now, I should just say, is so advanced than it was back in the 80s. So they have one pill. You can take one pill as opposed to back then you had to take a, a cocktail of pills and you can get undetectable. What does undetectable mean? Undetectable means that when you go get tested um, for the HIV virus, the number or the virus is so low, it can't be detected in your system. But it's still in the system, but just not detected. It's still going to be listed in your system because you've tested positive, but it can't be found by any tests. And when someone tests undetectable, are they still able to transmit it? Undetectable actually means that you won't transmit it. That's a uh, formula that they use that's called U equals U, and it's undetectable equals untransmittable. I'll still say use protection. Again, a lot of people, once they get diagnosed, they think their life is over and they start going into a lot of other things that are very dangerous, not realizing the things that they're starting to do is gonna hurt them more than the HIV. So they end up getting addicted to drugs and, and then they start having unprotected sex and they end up getting all these other STDs that will end up causing them to have a lot more issues than just having to deal with the HIV. But it's definitely a mental thing because a lot of people fall into depression. And that's another reason why I'm doing what I can because depression is the, is the main thing that we really have to conquer because that's what causes people to do a lot of things that they're doing. I want people to really understand a lot of things that we think is just in our minds and we are being misguided or we're misguiding ourselves. So do your best to find out information. Don't be afraid to, to, to Google if you're afraid to go into the buildings. It's so much information online that you can go to these different companies and read information online if you're embarrassed about going into the buildings. Uh, there's so many different phone numbers that you can call that you can get information and get support and people will just call you and check on you. It is so many ways to get help. You just have to be willing to accept it. And then once you start going through the process and even the therapy, 
You know, there's so many, so many things available that, that you can have access to. Would you say the quality of life now is much better than it was in the 80s or 90s when HIV first started? It was a little easier for me um, because I was already eating healthy. I was already exercising and doing those things. And they encourage you to do that a little bit more if you're not, because your body definitely needs to be healthy to be able to fight uh, what, what it's fighting against. But once you reach that level of being undetectable, you can have a normal life. You can have a regular relationship. I was even talking to a doctor about childbirth, and they said, you know, you, you're 99.9% chance of not transmitting the virus to your child if you try to have a, a child naturally. But you can still use the, the safety precautions and, 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 and um, use the procedures that they have in place, like, uh, sperm washing and all the other different um, options you have uh, to have a child or just have a normal life. The medicine is so advanced nowadays and the care, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised it's not a cure uh, for how advanced things are with this, with this disease, but I just really want people to understand just because someone is diagnosed, it doesn't determine their destiny. I know for me, when I did get it at first, I felt like I could no longer pursue my career as a model. I felt like I could no longer pursue my career as an actor because I was telling myself, nobody's gonna wanna touch me. Nobody's gonna wanna do a scene with me, if it's especially a kissing scene because they're, they're already, you know, don't wanna stand next to me. So I was having these thoughts go through my mind. A lot of jobs nowadays, they consider having HIV AIDS as a disability. Again, it's a mindset for the most part because even though it's written like that on the paper, you don't have to live as though you have a disability. You can live a normal life. Part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you is after meeting you, I felt like you were such a aggressively passionate person about career and goals and everything. And people I've seen in the past that got that diagnosis, it was kind of like they kind of gave up on everything, like, you know, all their goals and dreams. So. I really admire your passion and determination. I never really paid attention to it because I guess it's just me on the inside. Just I'm passionate about helping people. I'm passionate about uplifting people. And the more I, I hear that from people, I start to again reflect and start realizing, wow, God, so this is what you meant by why not you? Because... I'm really not doing it because I feel like I have to. It's really something I want to do. I don't know anybody else's belief, but I believe in God. And for me, uh, growing up, I would hear that his understanding is not our understanding. And as I go through life, I'm starting to understand a little bit more why I was put on this journey. And I'm very grateful and thankful. And I'm glad I accepted and said, yes, I will bear that cross. Not understanding at the time, well, we're thankful that you're doing this work and bringing awareness and supporting people with HIV and AIDS. And right now with coronavirus, it's almost like no one's <laughs> kind of thinking about any other type of virus, but you know, HIV and AIDS is still out there and it's awesome that you're doing this work. Coronavirus is causing a lot of people because they have to stay home. They have a lot of pent up energy and they do tend to forget. <laughs> <laughs> they still have to stay protected, um, you know, and that there are other things out there that they have to be cautious of, even though those uh, desires from being home and the cabin fever is getting to them. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone has cabin fever right now. <laughs> do you know how you contracted HIV? Actually, I do. Um, and I feel as though that was more of a a burden on me than actually uh, being diagnosed with HIV. Caught my ex cheating on me, and I was already feeling um, a bit weird because I'm one of those people that are very in tune with their body. And so when I did catch them cheating, I went to get tested the next day. And that's when I found out the reason I was feeling the way I was was because I was introduced to this virus. When I got the news, I, I cried. I cried for three days. I, and that was one of the things that hurt me the most. One of the things that hurt me the most because I felt betrayed. After 
going through the phase of just pouring my heart out to God after getting this diagnosis, that's when I started to get the messages that I can do this and I can transmutate this negative situation and I can live. That was the moment I shifted my perspective. And that's when I said, I'll do what I can, when I can, while I can, until he calls me home. And how long has it been since your initial diagnosis to now? My initial diagnosis was March of 2007. And during that time, you've managed to do so much. I really want to help people. And it's kind of from that, that perspective of a father, I guess you can say, who doesn't want his children to go through what he went through. Because some things are so painful, you wouldn't want anyone to experience. And you do your best to cover them with your wings. But some people just escape those wings or refuse to stay covered and they go out there anyway. But I continue to move forward after this diagnosis and thank God that I'm still here to do what I'm doing to, to keep people covered with the wings he's given me as a war angel. You mentioned war angel and you're definitely a warrior. <laughs> And that leads us into our next topic, <laughs> War Angel, your book and movie. I think you have a newer copy, right? Show us your copy. Yes, I actually changed the cover once, once I made the film. Tell us what War Angel is about. It was so weird how the book came along, because I, I never saw myself as a writer. I never saw myself as a writer. But I was working on this movie called Bessie. And I was standing in for Michael Williams. And when we rap, the director came to me and she said, hey, you want to be an actor, don't you? I said, oh, yeah. She said, I know I can tell <laughs> because you just exude actor. She said, uh, are you a writer? I said, no. She said, OK, well, something's telling me to tell you to write. I don't know what it is. And I don't know, I don't normally do this. I don't know why I'm walking over here because I don't talk to people like this. She said, but I couldn't shake it. So I had to come over here and tell you, something's telling me to tell you to write, create your own family. I said, okay, I think I know it's telling you to, to talk to me. So let me try this writing thing. Uh, <laughs> um, and I began to start trying to write. It didn't work. And I said, okay, well, like I told her, I do want to be an actor. So, hey, maybe I can just make my story like, like a movie or something. Um, because I had mentioned something on Facebook and someone said, you've been through a lot. You could write a movie about that. So I kind of wrote it in the script form. And then I said, okay, I don't know anything about making a movie. <laughs> God said, okay, well, it's not about you. It's about the story. Now you have the story written. I need you to make it into a book and share it with the world. So I started going through a lot of books. Color Purple was one of them on how it was written. And I said, OK, I'll use this format. And I just went ahead and just downloaded a software called Celtics and started just teaching myself how to uh, <laughs> format a book. Once I finished. I was ready to publish it because I got in contact with someone who told me about a self-publishing uh, software through uh, Create Space at the time. I think it's phased out to Amazon now. And I said, OK, I'm going to go ahead and self-publish this thing. Since I did all the work myself, I couldn't afford to hire anybody. And I, I kind of prayed. I said, OK, God, uh, yeah, I just realized I wrote a lot of things in the story that I never shared with anyone. Um, do you really want me to share this with the world? Not even 15 seconds passed and said breaking news. 12 year old boy just committed suicide because he was being bullied for being gay. I said, that's my answer. They cannot feel like they are alone 
Because I remember when I was 12 and I was going through so much and I felt like I was by myself. I'm going to share this story and I'm going to let them know they are not alone. And God does love them despite what people are telling them. And I self-published the story and next thing I know, people telling me he's a hero and a hero was born. I was just amazed at what was happening with, with me sharing the story. Is the book based loosely on your story? The book is a combination of physical events, visions, and dreams that I've had. It actually uh, starts out with um, a message, a message that I received and how uh, a lot of people nowadays still conduct themselves the way that a lot of people in the Bible did when it was written. One of the stories, I was, I kind of, I minimized how many people were attacked me. Um, but it, it, it talks about how I was attacked by religious people, physically attacked, uh, who tried to literally kill me. Let's just say their intentions were reversed. Um, but in reality, it was uh, over a hundred people in the story, I just said seven to represent the seven deadly sins. It's a lot of things that a lot of people may pick up on depending on how, how spiritual they are because there are a lot of hidden messages within the story or messages within the story. I wouldn't say hidden. They're, they're, they're right in your face, but some people just won't, won't recognize the messages uh, based on their, their level of spirituality, their beliefs. War Angels also now a movie. Yes. As I say that I wrote the, the story as, as a script, um, but I had never made a film before. So after sharing the story and people gravitating towards the story and relating to, to a lot of characters that they felt represented them, they wanted to help spread the message. And it's a lot of people also who I know can't read. And I just did everything I could to save up as much as I could to uh, put the story together and submitted paperwork to SAG uh, the union, and they helped me to convert it to make it a SAG new media project to allow people that were donating their time because pretty much everybody said, I don't care about being paid. I want to help get this story together. I said, I, I, I just want to be able to give you something back. And when I told that to the SAG office, they said, well, this is what you're going to give back to them. You're going to make them eligible for those who are serious about pursuing a career as an actor. And also, locations wanted to donate their locations so we were able to get it completed it was my first time ever making a movie i doubted myself so much because i never made a movie but again i was determined to share the story to the people who could not read and I also give the visual to a lot of people who miss some of the messages as best as possible and we created a film in atlanta uh, my first time editing a movie as well and once i finished editing everything i put it on youtube so people will be able to watch it free of charge and that leads us into a real desire <laughs> your nonprofit. after finally starting to realize that i can have a life i can live i was going on uh auditions uh, as the model and I created business cards that were almost like comp cards. And I had my name and then I put underneath a real desire. And as I was talking to some of the models that were there audition, they said, oh, a real desire, what's the name of your agency? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, is a company that you work for? I said, no. Well, what is it? I said, it's what I have. I have a real desire. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make something of myself. They said, well, it sounds like a company. You should use that. I said, no, that will be fine. And they were like, well, you're giving people advice and information based on what you're experiencing. People will pay you for that. I said, well, I don't want people to pay me to help them. I mean, I don't mind sharing what I've experienced if it's going to help them to not go through that. They said, well, you should charge people. You can make a killing off of that. So I talked to God. I said, OK. I want to help people, but I don't want to have to charge people. And someone heard me because I tend to talk out loud sometimes. <laughs> Ch 
She said, well, I work for uh, the Georgia State of Department. We can actually turn that into a nonprofit or a nonprofit organization for you, no charge. I said, really? She said, yeah, because we need something like that. And I'm hearing what you want to do. And you can do that and you can help people and you can do it this way. And then people can pour into you and donate and help you. And I was like, yeah, that's amazing. Let's do that. So next thing I know, I had a nonprofit organization. Then next thing I know, I said, well, instead of me using my tax return to go buy a car, I'm going to apply for my 501c3 status because people are trying to charge me $1,500 for the ones who are trying to take advantage of me. And someone else from the IRS reached out and said, no, we can help you do the paperwork and you just pay the $400 to get things filed. It normally takes about a year or two, but it's, it's a lot cheaper. I said, well, let's do it. I filed the paperwork within three months, everything was approved. Can you tell us some of the things that you do with a real desire? One thing that really pushed me to start a real desire was I would go to an audition and they would say, just work on that. But they would never tell me what to work on. So I was kind of in the wind on what to do. And I created the organization to be able to reach out to other people in the industry to come and give people exact information on what they need to do and what they need to work on to better their passion, be it a dancer, singer, model, actor, whatever it is in the, in the performing arts industry. I want to be able to educate them with the schooling that they need without them having to pay anything and just prepare them for their, for, their, for their dream career. I enjoy putting on the different talent shows with the, with the kids or adults as well so that they can get a chance to perform for someone that's different from the family. And then at the same time, I invite people like agencies or somebody uh, from probably a TV network to come and, and watch these kids to, to hopefully give them an opportunity to connect with someone who has a much bigger platform than I do, giving people that opportunity to experience performing for an audience is like something on their bucket list or something they wish they could do. And it really just sometimes fuels their fire or sometimes just allows them to just, that's what I always wanted to do. Now I can go and do this. That first time on stage or performance um, will <laughs> kind of establish it for you, right? <laughs> yes. So now I'm in a process of even furthering that because I moved to New York to get more insight with a lot of things. And now I'm prepared to take a real desire to a whole nother level. And I'm wanting to include foster care because a lot of people in foster care, they are not able to pursue a passion. They're just kind of lost. So there's so many things I see that can help or the organization can help with that I really want to, to elevate and build with. That's awesome. I wish I had that when I got started. <laughs> and, that's how, and that's what I think leads us to start a lot of these organizations because a lot of things we don't have, again, we want other people to have it because we know what it feels like to not have it. And that's really what drives, drives me to, to build this organization. You're doing so many amazing things in front and behind the camera and behind the scenes and your activism. And I just, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing um, to have gone through what you've gone through and, and still, you know, be guided, you know, with God by your side, just you know, going, going forward. That's one of the blessings that I'm grateful for, because um, I know a lot of times when people start reading the story, like you, you went through all of this and you're still smiling. Like I would have committed suicide or I would have been like so medicated on or self-medicated on all kind of drugs and alcohol. How is it that you don't drink and you don't smoke <laughs> after going through something like this? And again, it starts making me realize, wow, I see why you chose me. You mentioned throughout, you know, the interview, your faith in God. Tell, tell me what that means to you and how it's guided you. Well, like I said, ever since I was a kid, I would, 
would see my mom pray and I saw her prayers answered because her faith wasn't shaken and it helped to strengthen my faith. And also a lot of things I experienced as a child, a lot of dreams I had, a lot of visions I had as a child and what even strengthened my faith more was after leaving the church uh, because of what a lot of people were saying to me and it made me feel unwanted. I, I grew up in a Pentecostal church and they were very, some of them were very ruthless when it came to their words. And there were a lot of things I was, I was dealing with that I didn't share with a lot of people at the church because I already knew how they felt about it because they had already verbalized it. So it didn't make any sense for me to share anything with them. So I decided, well, they're judging me. They don't want to accept me in, in their, you know, their, their words, pretty much. I'm not wanted and God doesn't love me. All my experience with leaving the church allowed me to actually get closer to God. And at first I didn't understand it either. And my relationship, really grew after leaving the church. So when I did decide to come back to the church, I started correcting them. I started actually telling them, well, this is what I learned. This is what I was shown. And you're saying this, but you can't do the first rule that you're telling people that they should do, which is love thy neighbor as thyself. Or is it that you don't love yourself? So I was actually able to build my confidence as well while I built that relationship. And I started really understanding what faith was. You know, it saddens me to hear that, you know, going away from the church <laughs> made you strong. But, you know, sometimes we're, when we're in that crowd, you know, um, it's hard to hear the voice we need to hear. Well, I'm glad you were able to strengthen your relationship and definitely be open to listening to be divinely guided through this whole process that's awesome tell us about your gospel mime work that's another thing i really enjoy doing um because i realized for some people it can be entertainment and for a lot of other people i found that it's healing their soul um it's a way for me it's gospel music and it's, it's also a way that you could say I'm kind of using my acting career because I do my best to tell the story with just movements. Because of the energy in the song, a lot of people, a lot of times are restored or sometimes it just helps them to just, as we say, wusa. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's amazing because it is such a healing moment for from what I've been told, it kind of came to me by accident. Um, when I was going to the church that actually showed me and told me that because of what I was being a bisexual male, that I could still do work for God. And yes, that was God talking to me. And yes, I could still do things with the church. And I kind of saw someone do it one day and I felt my body moving while they were actually up there and I said, this is something I think I want to do. And I kind of taught myself how to do it and just allowed my body to just speak to the people. And to be honest with you, some people say it's a form of ministry. You were right. You are a minister or a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. You know the crazy thing, Antoy, it's like, I have people, when they see me my mime, or I guess when I say certain things to kind of pour into them, they'll send me a message to say, hey, pastor. I say, pastor? <laughs> I'm not a pastor. <laughs> I'm not a pastor. <laughs> well, you my pastor because you pour it to me. I say, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, as artists, our, our work can be our ministry, you know, because we do, if we're doing it from passion and, and with the proper guidance, we we can change lives, we can make a difference, you know? Yes. So I look at my work as, you know, my gift and my ministry, you know? Whatever I'm doing, if I'm acting, whatever it may be. So I think it's kind of the same for you. It, it really is. And I guess it just kind of throws me because I'm not doing it for titles. I just do it because I just really, 
I enjoy helping people. I really enjoy helping people. I know for a while I was putting myself in predicaments or putting myself in situations trying to help people and just sacrificing everything I had just to make sure other people have. Um, but it just does something to my heart, especially when I see good people receiving what they deserve to receive to help them to flourish. So what's next for you, Matthew? We're actually working on a mini series to actually showcase the story War Angel Inner Demons. It's going to be as of right now a six part series. Inner Demons can mean anything. Inner Demons can be a thought, it can be depression, it can be something that's haunting you and, and keeping you and suppressing you from actually achieving to be who you can be in life. A lot of secrets are being revealed in this story and I think I really love this story even more than The Awakening um, because it's touching on a lot of things that a lot of people don't want to talk about, need to talk about, and helping to release a lot of inner thoughts and a lot of inner demons that a lot of people are, are actually confronting or being attacked by. I want everyone to be able to experience all of your amazing work. So where can they get War Angel, the book? Both books, because I do have two books. War Angel, The Awakening, as well as War Angel, Inner Demons, is on Amazon, it's Barnes and Nobles, and it's also on Kindle, if they enjoy the electric version. And it is electric. It will shock you. That's why I said <laughs> that. <laughs> and where can they see the movie? They can watch the movie on YouTube. It's free to watch. All they have to do is just go to YouTube, search War Angel, The Awakening, and where can they go to add value to a real desire? Visit my website uh, for the organization to get a little bit more information about who I am. And that's arealdesire.org. They can also pour into the organization uh, by clicking on the donate button. And they can also do it through PayPal. If anybody's interested in investing in any projects that we're working on, please feel free to do so. And they just want to connect with me personally. I'm on Facebook. Uh, all about Matt. I also have an Instagram, uh, War Angel Reborn. Uh, there's also an Instagram for the organization, A Real Desire. I'm here. If, if, if anybody has any questions they want to ask me, feel free to reach out to me. Awesome. So there are many ways that you guys can support Matthew and all of the work that he's doing with HIV and AIDS as an actor, model, gospel mime, or supporting the nonprofit where he's helping artists to realize their dreams. All right, so go and check out Matthew, get his book, watch the movie, and contribute and add value to all the amazing things he's working on. Add him on your social media so that you can follow him and stay up to date on all of his amazing activities. So, what advice would you like to leave? our viewers with? A diagnosis is not your destiny. And if you come across someone else who was diagnosed with something, don't judge them based on that diagnosis. A lot of people, which is why I take the pictures I take, don't look like what they're going through. So you have to be very careful on how you actually talk to people sometimes, because you never know what they're dealing with. Don't expect other people to have the same passion that you have for your dream. You have to maintain that energy because it's your dream. And as you progress, others will then understand what you're doing and they're going to start seeing the vision. And even when it looks like people don't understand that they're not with you, when you stay the course, you'll be amazed on how many people are actually with you. And I say, amen to that, pastor. <laughs> <laughs> look like a pastor with his vest on, huh? <laughs> you did, right? You look like you came straight out of the church. Yeah, and patting the head. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Matthew. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for sharing your story, um, definitely inspiring. And I hope people can see this and feel like they can push through whatever challenges or obstacles or diagnosis that they might 
receive and still live a passionate, determined, fulfilled, faithful life. Amen to that. If you like what you see on any of our episodes, feel free to share it and add us on your social media platforms. Did you guys see the jewelry I was wearing today? Well, it was provided by fashion stylist and my girl, Latoya Mack. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you'd like more information and inspiring episodes, go to youtube.com backslash The Antoy Show, mangoc.tv, and antoygrant.com. See you guys soon.